We're going to begin our time together. Again, welcome, Chilai. Hello, Greece Campus. We're going to begin our time by looking at a verse in Proverbs 13, 12. And I'm hoping we can read it with each other. From nice and loud. It says, Delayed hope makes one sick at heart, but a fulfilled longing is a tree of life. I wonder if we could read it one more time, just up to that first comma there. Let's read it together. Delayed hope makes one sick at heart. Now, when I felt deeply that this was going to be a verse that I wanted to communicate here at church today, I knew that I had some studying to do. I wanted to understand more of the nature of the physical heart, why God would make the connection to the spiritual heart and everything else associated with it. And one of the things that I read about the physical heart beating inside all of us right now is that it pumps oxygen and nutrient-rich blood through the body to sustain our life. Let me read this to you. They call it this fist-sized powerhouse. It beats, it expands, and it contracts 100,000 times per day, pumping five or six quarts of blood each minute or about 2,000 gallons per day throughout our body. Now, there are some very obvious symptoms that I read we'll begin to experience if our physical heart begins to grow weak. It'll be things like discomfort, heaviness, pressure, aching, a burning sensation. <clears throat> Excuse me, we may also begin to feel pain in our shoulders, in our arms, in our neck, in our throat, in our jaw, or in our back. We'll begin to feel palpitations. We'll begin to have a faster heartbeat, weakness, or dizziness, or nausea. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 12, delayed hope makes one sick at heart. So the question is, why is God continually making the connection between the physical and the spiritual heart? Because the heart being referred to in this verse refers to the very center of our spiritual, our emotional, our intellectual, our moral well-being. When David says, create in me a clean heart, he's not referring to his physical heart. He's saying, God, would you create in me a purity and the very center of who I am as a person? So when it says in Proverbs 13, 12, delayed hope makes us emotionally and spiritually sick and the very center of who we are. Let me read this to you. I put down, just as God designed our physical heart to require blood to flow through it to keep the rest of our bodies healthy. Listen to what I'm about to say. God has also designed our spiritual, our emotional heart, the very center of who we are, to have hope flowing through it to keep the rest of our lives healthy. Listen to this. When blood stops pumping, we die physically. When hope stops pumping, we die spiritually and emotionally. But here's the good news. Hope is limitless and completely accessible. No one or nothing can keep hope from coming to you. Hope is as available right now in this moment to the rich as it is to the poor. Hope is as available right now in this moment to the sick as it is to the healthy. Come on, Greece and child. I hope is as available right now in this moment, right now, Hope is as available to the young as it is to the old. But what really makes the difference that I want to propose to you today is our posture to receive and to defend hope. Ultimately, we engage, we encounter real living hope by entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Would you read Romans 10, 9 with me? Nice and loud it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will what? You will be saved. 1 Peter 1, 3. I love this verse. Come on, nice and loud together today. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we go. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into what? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The moment that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, I believe in the very core of who I am as a Christ follower, it represented limitless hope accessible to me, my family, my children, everyone watching this right now when we want to receive it. 
But the question is, how do we defend it? Because some of us have experienced, like I have in my life, hope, it can feel like a roller coaster. Sometimes we have hope, sometimes we don't, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. How do we defend this hope inside of us? Because we know the Bible says in John 10.10 10, that we have an enemy, that there is evil opposition in this world, demonic things, evil, trying to take from us what is rightfully ours as Christ followers, trying to take it from our homes. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I want to say this. What I've experienced in my life is not so much that the enemy tries to take my hope. He tries to get me to put my hope in other things besides Christ. Listen, I love my family so much, but I cannot place my hope in my family. I love my job. I love being a pastor. I really do. But I cannot place my hope in my job. I deeply enjoy my friendships and the relationships within my life but I cannot place my hope in my friendships or in my relationship because there is only one foundation that does not shift and change. There is only one God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But listen to me what I'm saying. When my foundation, when my hope is in Christ, how much of a greater contribution do I make to my family? When my foundation, when my hope is solely rooted in Christ, how much of a better employee, manager, a business owner, pastor are we? When my hope is rooted in Jesus Christ, how much better of a friend am I? Because then I am a person that's choosing to live on a solid foundation. I can go into my prayer closet anytime and encounter the same God, the same mercy, the same love, the same kindness, the same compassion. It is always there waiting for me. So the question is, will you and I choose today, if our hope has been on shifting sand, to put all of our hope back in the one that died and rose from the dead for us so that we can be a solid rock and a greater foundation for all those around us? Now, before we move on to Pastor Robbie, uh, Pastor Robbie had a care need within his family that he had to tend to. Good news is he was here the first two services, so our amazing technical teams work together in Chile and Greece to capture his message today, so you're not going to miss out. So I want you to sit back right now and enjoy the incredible seven-minute teaching that Pastor Robbie delivered this morning. Check this out. Man, can we thank God for Pastor Chris one more time? That was awesome. PC. Well, listen, today we're talking about audacious hope. Uh, and I think that this is such an appropriate principle to engage, uh, considering everything that's going on around us in the world. There's so many outrageous things that have been happening and are happening in our world. Everything from people uh, wanting to justify the engagement of, of fear and hatred and bringing other people along on that journey to, to natural disasters that we're experiencing that are, that are claiming the lives of many and displacing uh, many others. But here you and I sit today, this Sunday, this rainy Sunday morning, <laughs> and we're talking about having audacious hope. Well, the question is, what, what is hope? What is an audacious hope? And as I was preparing for this message, I started doing some research, and I came across an article, and the title of the article was The Problem with Hope. And it kind of took me aback because I'm thinking, hope, what is, what is the problem with hope? <clears throat> hope doesn't have a, there's no problem with hope. This is a good thing. But I begin to read this article, and I want to read you an excerpt from this article. It's very interesting. The writer says, but both hope and despair are only perceptual. They're nothing more than educated guesses since they're pointed towards a future set of circumstances which are, by definition, unknown. Even if hope or despair are educated guesses based upon an objectively valid appraisal of the current known set of circumstances, they're not guaranteed to materialize into the expected outcome. In this sense, hope and despair are two sides of the same coin, the expectations coin. I thought, wow. Like this writer is making the argument that hope and despair are subjective and just a matter of our perception. We either perceive that we have something to hope for or we don't. There is no real objective reason for hope in their opinion. Furthermore, they suggest that the objectivity of hope is based on current circumstances. Now, it made me wonder, if this is what people believe, that, that their hope is based on only what's happening now, that it's not a coincidence as why we see so many people in our society giving in to fear, giving in to doubt, giving in to hate, giving in to all of the things that actually make us less than what we should be. If our hope is only based on the here and now, then we cannot think of anything better 
for the future. So surely we're going to have very little hope if that's where our focus is. Now, when we look at hope defined, it means to cherish and desire with anticipation, to desire with expectation of obtainment, to expect with confidence. In essence, it means to have a great expectation of something in the future. Now, we must understand as Christ followers that the hope that we have in Christ is not fleeting, nor is it subjective, but it is a promise that was given to us by a God that loves and cherishes us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 7, and Pastor Chris uh, already uh, took a, uh, said a little bit of this one. I'm just going to read it. Here we go. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, for he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Listen, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is he saying? He's saying that we have a hope that is living imperishable, undefiled, unfading through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not just a hope, but an audacious hope. And I love this word audacious because if you look this word up, it just means very confident and daring, very bold and surprisingly shocking, intrepidly daring. But what's the coolest thing about this word audacious is all the synonyms. Because every synonym to audacious points to behavior that is actually offensive. The, the, the synonyms of audacious are words like boldface brazen, impudent, sassy, brash. So when we are walking in an audacious hope, we're actually walking in a knowing of better things to come that actually may offend others who don't understand this hope. So you may experience when you're walking in audacious hope, people say things to you like, I don't know why you're so happy. Life is really not that great. Or, or your attitude just really makes me sick because every time I see you, you're just smiling for no reason. Or you may run into people that are like, you know what, I wish that I could think like that. I don't know why you do, but I wish that I could. I wish that I could be that way. When we're walking in audacious hope, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see the silver lining in a dark sky. We have peace when life feels like dusk because we know that the sun will rise again. And we do not allow the circumstances of this world to dictate the temperature of our hope and faith. And I believe that the biggest reason that people don't understand true hope is because we struggle to grasp the reality of God's love. We have this mushy, emotional idea of God's love based on our own subjective definition of what it is. But when we under tr uh, truly understand his love for us, there's nothing that will shake our hope in what he has promised us. You know, my children uh, do not ever wonder whether they're going to be taken care of or not because mommy and daddy love them. Mommy and daddy take care of them. So they have an expectation that they're going to eat. They have an expectation that they're going to have all the things they need. So they don't fear lack or danger. And when we understand that the foundation of hope is God's love and that he loved us so immensely that he gave everything for us, we'll have a hope that just might be offensive to some people, but it's an audacious hope that not only encourages, encourages us, but compels us to spread his hope to others. The author and apologist Ravi Zacharias put it like this. Outside of the cross of Jesus Christ, there is no hope in the world. That cross and resurrection at the core of the gospel is the only hope for humanity. Wherever you go, ask God for wisdom on how to get that gospel in, even in the toughest situations of life. See, when we have this audacious, brazen hope, uh, a hope that is without fear, we can endure without bitterness. We can endure without losing faith, and we can endure living a life that's obedient and victorious in God. Because Jesus said this in John 16, 33, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace, and in this world you'll have tribulation. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Oh, All right, that was a great word, wasn't it? You know, I remember in no particular order hoping to become an Olympic athlete, hoping to become a politician, hoping that my wife would say yes when I proposed, 
hoping to become rich, hoping to become a circus performer, that's true, hoping for healing in my family, hoping as a little kid to one day take over the entire world. I've watched hope kindled in my children now as they dream of an incredible future, but I've also watched hope crushed when a friend is mean or inconsiderate to them. We all experience the highs and lows of hope. So what happens though when hope seems just out of reach? What happens when our current reality seems to preclude any chance of optimism? What happens when the advice of our friends and the books and the podcasts fall short? On May 26, 1940, the British army faced what seemed like a hopeless situation. Nazis had conquered almost all of Europe and they had trapped the allied troops on the beaches of Dunkirk and all attempts to rescue the troops seemed to fail. At that moment, Winston Churchill called it the greatest military defeat in history. Maybe your life at times feels like the beaches of Dunkirk. Do you ever uh, seem to struggle to see any hope in the face of what seems like insurmountable obstacles? Well, I'm here today to tell you that your story is not finished. God isn't done with you yet. In fact, God's not done with your challenge. He has a plan. And if we are willing to listen to his word, we'll find out that there's hope for our present, there's hope from God for our future, and there's hope for our eternity. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8, where we read this. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Paul, the man who wrote this, understood the trouble of suffering. He was acquainted with challenge, but he also knew that there was a limit to the trials he would face. Look at how he chose to use these words together. He talks about being perplexed, but not in total despair. Being hunted, but not abandoned by God. Paul was close many times in his life to a breaking point, but he knew his story wasn't done. Now, maybe you are close to a breaking point as well, but you need to understand that our hope for the present lies in the fact that every trial we face has a limit. And if you don't accept that, then you've stopped reading your story before it is finished. The Lord of the Rings fans, imagine if you stopped reading before Frodo throws the ring in and saves eternity because the journey was too difficult. Imagine uh, if you like Jane Austen and you read Pride and Prejudice, but you stopped before Darcy and, um, and uh, Elizabeth resolve their issues. Okay, it's really quiet. Nobody reads Pride and Prejudice, I guess. Sorry about that. Let's try one more, maybe a little more relevant. Imagine Star Wars fans, if you stopped, I got an amen already. If you stopped watching while Luke was hanging upside down frozen in that icy cave, that would be a bad story because here's the deal. Stories have to be finished for us to understand the purpose of the struggle. If you're in a struggle right now, keep on going. Your story isn't finished. Let's look at the rest of the story Paul offers here in verse 14. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us. Say raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving. Our hope for the future is that every trial has a limit and a purpose. You see, Paul doesn't promise that the trial will go away. Rather, he says, if you place your hope in Jesus through the struggle, that you will be raised up. The original word here talks about waking up from sleep or waking up from death. Man, I love the sound of that. Imagine one day waking up from your trial and realizing that you've been invigorated with strength from God to step into a bold new future that he designed for you. There's this incredible Mexican proverb. It says, they buried us, but they did not know that we were seeds. I wonder what God might be germinating in you right now because of the struggle that you are facing. Let's look at the end of the verse. It says, all of this allows God's grace to reach more and more people. Your struggle, your story, it's not just about you. In fact, your future is intended to inspire hope in others if you're willing to pursue through what God has for you. You know, the end of that story of the troops in Dunkirk is fascinating. Countless small naval vessels 
and over 800 civilians took their boats across the English Channel and picked up 300,000 troops, brought them back to Britain. The result of that was that the Allies were able to regroup and ultimately win World War II. And here's what Churchill had to say about this. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight in the fields and the streets. We shall fight on the hills. We will never surrender. The trials that God allows in your life are the very building blocks that he will use to place his glory in you if you're willing to engage in the fight and never surrender. But our reason for hope is so much greater than knowing there's a limit, to our, a limit and a purpose to our trials. In fact, Paul goes on to say there's actually an eternal reality that we often miss because of the storms and fog of life. Look at verse 17. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that can't be seen. Paul is trying to show us a glimpse of the end of our story. He's trying to let us understand that we are being prepared for greatness. We are being prepared through our struggles and our suffering for a glory that vastly outweighs everything that is in our life right now. Our hope for eternity is that every trial has a limit, a purpose, and an eternal reward. You need to know that your struggle is not in vain. Your story isn't finished. The God of the universe, the author of all things, has his quill right above the manuscript of your life, waiting to finish his masterpiece in you. Will you, like Paul challenges us, fix your gaze on God and the unseen things that he offers? Because I believe that God is looking for people who are audacious enough to believe that he is preparing them to carry his glory. That is what I put my hope on.